Good afternoon, buenas tardes, and thank you for tuning in. I'm Christina Nosti, Events and Marketing Director at Books and Books in Miami, Florida, who today proudly joins forces with Brazos Bookstore in Houston, Texas, Harvard Bookstore in Boston, Mass, and Politics and Prose in Washington, D.C., to bring you this afternoon's virtual program with Cristina Rivera Garza in conversation with Merve Emre to discuss Liliana's Invincible Summer, A Sister's Search for Justice, published by our friends at Hogarth Press. Cristina Rivera Garza is the award-winning author of The Taiga Syndrome and The Iliac Crest, among many other books, a recipient of the MacArthur Genius Grant and the Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz Prize, Rivera Garza is a professor of Hispanic Studies at the University of Houston, where she also directs the Creative Writing Program. To moderate this afternoon's conversation, we're joined by Merve Embre, a professor at Oxford, the author of several books, and an award-winning critic at The New Yorker. She is currently a distinguished writer in residence at Wesleyan University. Throughout this broadcast, please remember to post your questions for the author in the Q&A function, and thank you for purchasing your copy of Liliana's Invincible Summer from Books and Books, Brazos Bookstore, Harvard Bookstore, or Politics and Prose, and for supporting independent bookstores everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest to the virtual stage. Hello. And welcome. Hello. Hi. Hi. Christina, hi. Uh, and other Christina, thank you for that, for that introduction. I'm so incredibly happy to be here with you today to talk about Liliana's Invincible Summer, which I read the first three sections of in Spanish when it was published originally. And when I received this version from Hogarth Press, I kept flipping through looking for the name of the translator because you've worked with so many extraordinary translators in the past whom I deeply admire and was surprised to discover that there was no translator uh, and that you had either self-translated or in some cases I felt had rewritten yourself into English. And I thought maybe we could start by talking about the different lives of this book as it has mm -hmm. traveled across countries and through languages. Well, wonderful. Um, thank you. Thank you, Christina, for the introduction. And thank you, Marve, Marve for being here. Although uh, I don't know if this is okay, but I, I'm not able to see you on the screen. So- uh, Oh, I can see you. I don't know, I don't know if this is just me. Uh, Who is but there? I, Christina, she is okay. there. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so it's just me. Well, maybe Wonderful. it's just Wi-Fi, and hopefully oh, yeah. she'll, she'll come back in. So as soon as your Wi-Fi adjusts, it's probably just the strength of your Wi-Fi. But she is there. It's okay. I'm happy well, to be a ghost. A ghost in the. I'm happy to be a ghost in the machine. That's okay. <laughs> Well, thank you, Merve, for, for your question. And uh, you know that I, I admire your work greatly. So I'm, I'm really happy to have you here in this conversation, welcoming uh, Liliana's, Liliana and Liliana's Invincible Summer uh, into the English-speaking world. And uh, I would have to say, to begin with, that everything I write, either in Spanish or in English, I write it from what I've been calling a translation mode. Um, I've been living, I was born on the Mexican side of the U.S. border, and I've lived in the United States for many, many years now, about 30 years, more or less. And I'm only bilingual, so I'm, I'm, um, I become uh, increasingly aware of the influence and the power of Spanish over English and English over Spanish in all what I do. And uh, in this case, I, when I started working on this book, um, many of the sections came to me naturally in Spanish, mm -hmm. as is usually the case in other books. But many of them also came to me uh, in English. Uh, and I very soon decided that instead of fighting against this urge, 
or what seemed to me at that point to be an urge, I would just uh, let it be. Mm. So what what I did was to keep files for both the, the sections in Spanish and then the sections in English. And I use either language, both languages, to, to revise and to rewrite. Mm. So I, I was in that way trying to uh, be very alert about what I at times do automatically in Spanish. And, uh, and I was trying also to be very alert about what English was provided providing me with throughout the writing of the book. I think now, from the point of view of the present, I think that the sections, I, I, I'm not so sure which ones came first in English and, and which ones in, in Spanish, but I believe that uh, English provided me with a um, certain emotional distance that was very important to me throughout the book. So Spanish, uh, I mean, I grew up speaking Spanish and obviously a lot of my emotional history is, is uh, it comes in Spanish. Mm -hmm. But I've been also uh, living and working and, and being creative in English for a number of years. So there is an emotional relationship, although a very different one. And I think, uh, uh, Right from the beginning, I needed both distances to approach a subject that was very close to my heart. I was thinking about, I was thinking, frankly, about how you managed to write, to write this book, which is a heartbreaking book at moments. And I was thinking about the different strategies or techniques of distance that you must have employed. And one of them that came to mind was the distancing strategies of the archivist, because what you've created here is a kind of personal counter archive to the archives of the state. And for those who haven't read the book, when you read it, you'll realize it opens with Christina trying to find her sister's case file and not being able to find it and not knowing if she will be able to find it and then creating as a kind of counter history uh, or bringing together as a kind of counter history all of these different documents and testimonies from her sister's past. Did the, do the tactics of the archive, of the sociologist, of the anthropologist, of the scribe, are those distancing strategies for you or are they also ways of getting close to what exists in the past. Yeah, that, that's a, a very good way of starting this conversation. I, I in fact, think of, uh, of the work with the archives as a ways of approaching storytelling from, uh, from a very different perspective, from a very different angle. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we know that uh, gender violence has been conveyed um, very often through patriarchal narratives, through state narratives, which usually uh, blame the victim and exonerate the, the, the predator. Uh, and these, these uh, are, are known by names such as um, the, the passionate crime storyline, or in the United States, the dead girl story. Yeah. So it was very important for me for, from, from the start of of this idea of, uh, of writing this book um, to, to subvert that, that story, to be able to tell this sadly very common story in our days, even today, um, in, uh, through, through different alternative strategies, literary strategies. Mm -hmm. So I, I was fortunate enough that I came across um, a very rich um, file that my sister had built of herself. I flew into Mexico City during the early 2020s. We were still able to travel back then. And uh, I was looking for some pieces of information about my sister's old friends. I wanted, my husband and I wanted to locate them and I wanted to talk with them, essentially because I was interested in opening up the case again. Mm 
And I was not expecting the, the many papers, the richness of this archive. Once I, I took a look at it, I knew that definitely I had to, I had to write this book. I had felt obviously the, the need of doing that, especially during the early days uh, of the pandemic, mm -hmm. thinking that, uh, that this was a book, that I came to this world and to the world of, of, of literature to write this book that I've been trying to write for such a long time. Mm -hmm. so, and I have failed miserably for a couple of times uh, in the past. So once I got these, um, these papers, they were very important for two reasons. It's not only that they, that they provided me with, um, with new pieces of information, it was not only the content of the archive, for me, it was equally relevant, if not more relevant, the fact that it contained original writings by my sister. Not only the kind of writings that through which a teenager is trying to express herself, but also the kind of writings in which she was playing very openly with form. Yeah. So um, in reading them, I realized that there was this very specific work with, um, with rhythm with repetition, with punctuation marks. And all of them gave me a sense of, um, of her breathing patterns. Mm. So I, I later uh, came to read, or I was, uh, I was about, uh, at that time, during those years, I was reading very carefully the, this, this wonderful work by critic Christina Sharp in mm. The Wake on blackness and being, specifically the chapter four, um, uh, the weather, the chapter on the weather. And here she spoke um, in such a compelling way about the archives of breathlessness, about how the state keeps on choking out, ch choking life out of targeted bo bodies. And I was reminded of the fact that um, the official cause of uh, my sister's passing was suffocation. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I when I saw when I got to read uh, her own writings, I, and I was so much thinking about this this breath uh, that I was uh, getting close to, I thought that these archives, hers in any case, mm -hmm. was way beyond the, the field uh, covered by the state. These were effective archives. But at the same time, these were um, breath archives, yeah. archives that, that allowed me to get uh, very close to Liliana in, very, in a very organic, material way. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, I'm sorry for this meandering, no, that's but it. Um, that's it is a way it is a way for uh, you know for certain uh, distance, emotional distance, but but it is also a way of extreme closeness, mm. of bringing those breathing patterns into page. Mm. I I think that ultimately uh, played a major role in shaping not only uh, in shaping the structure of the book, in shaping the form that the book took. Yeah. Do you did you feel like when you discovered those writings and there's some very very beautiful poems that you include of hers in the book? Did you feel like there was a resonance with your own breathing patterns that are inscribed in, for instance, your earliest short stories, which have some of that same kind of rhythm that I felt like I heard or felt in both her poems and some of her letters. Did you have a moment of genetic recognition or familiarity, or did you feel, as, as one often does with one's sisters, did you feel a kind of a, a real distance there? Wow, what a wonderful question. Um, both, I, I could say, uh, uh, on the one hand, I was struck by um, what seemed to me an eerie similarity. I, in fact, had to go back to my own writings from that time, just trying to check who wrote what first. Yeah. Uh, there was a sense that we were sharing addiction, 
uh, 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 a vocabulary, if you want to call it that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a sense that the issues that she was talking about and, uh, and the way in which she was approaching them, um, since that, that, that I have been working with that, with that set of materials or with the same kind of obstacles. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I have to say that uh, reading these materials allowed me to, to meet um, the many Lilianas contained in Liliana. Mm -hmm. I, of course, was um, her sister, her oldest, older sister, mm -hmm. um, but I was not a best friend in college. I was not a guy in love with her. Mm -hmm. I was not a professor. So um, in talking with um, with her friends, uh, sharing stories with other family members, mm -hmm. I came to, to discover uh, these many Lilianas. So mm -hmm. in a way, when readers are, are getting to know Liliana, I think I was going through, through a similar process uh, mm -hmm. In the, in the writing process too. You know, there is um, something that's so interesting to me. So for people who haven't read the, the book, one of the things that I think Christina does incredibly in it is to take testimonies from Liliana's friends. And you can see they're sort of broken up on the page by the name of the person. And one of the things you say in your afterward is that, you spoke with all of these people to get a sense of their memories of Liliana, but that you didn't record what they said, you transcribed. And for me, what was fascinating about that was on the one hand, there is, or there are distinctions between the voices of these different people and their points of view and how they see Liliana. On the other hand, they're all being arranged or they're kind of passing through the filter of, of your voice. How did you mm -hmm. how did you think about that? Why did you make that decision? Why not simply record and transcribe directly as opposed to listening, transcribing, and then and then shaping it yourself? Sure. Look, there is a lot of research behind this book. Uh, it is a book obviously based on on experience and, and memory, but I understand memory also as a practice, and in this case, as a collective practice. Yeah. So uh, the research, the archival research, the field research, um, um, the interviews, all of them to me uh, were a way of, of building this embrace, this this collective embracing of, of Liliana. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the of the conversations I had with her former friends, I was very clear about a couple of things and I'm sure about many, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to talk with them as candidly as possible. Mm -hmm. I didn't pose a specific questions. I just asked them my 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 first and only questions in many cases was for them to share with me uh, the first memory that came to them when I mentioned the name of Liliana. Mm. Um, so they were free to choose which one to share with me, for how long, how many times they wanted to go back to it. I, uh, I, uh, I was talking with them over the phone. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, it had been really, really difficult to, to locate these phone numbers. In some other cases, they, they were just, uh, we were just lucky and, um, and, uh, and we got to them through um, social, social media. Mm -hmm. And all of them were um, incredibly generous with their time and with their memory and very willing to participate in these conversations. I also told them that I was not going to be recording them, that I was going to be uh, trying to, I was going to transcribe as, as we were talking. And the explanation I gave to them, which was the same one that I gave to, to myself, mm. was uh, I was trying to avoid um, yet another mediation, which was, we were already talking over the phone. Yeah, yeah. And, and then I didn't want to have uh, the recorder being yet another mediation between both of us. Mm -hmm. So when you record, you have to transcribe no matter what. So I was trying to, to um, 
to fulfill that, that task too. Mm. I also told them, of course, that, uh, that I was going to be doing a first uh, rendition of the conversation. They were going to have total access to, to, to everything. I was writing to the first draft, uh, second, third, whatever number of drafts I had to go through uh, in order to, 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 tr to be faithful to, to what we had shared. Mm -hmm. So um, in some cases, uh, some, of these, um, some of these old friends were, were fine with the first uh, draft. Some of them were very careful about things that I had uh, not recorded correctly, some dates, some names, for example. And then there were some that, that were very careful about the phrasing and, and the way in which their voice came through. One of them, I remember Raul, remember Raul Espino told me, I would never say the word campus. I mean, that's something that they would never cross my mind. And so I would say escuela, school or university, but never in my in my life we use the word campus. And I said, that's fine. I mean, I'll delete that that one because obviously that's something that I was bringing uh, mm. to the text that was not faithful to, to the way in which he saw that world and his world in general. But I try to to keep up um, the conversation as, as transparent and as open as possible. Mm. And then in each rendition, as I was trying to create uh, a tone, you know, for the book, right. uh, allowing, of course, uh, specificity and difference, but at the same time, and same time, trying to to keep a certain momentum, certain mm -hmm. sense of, of speed and rhythm. Mm -hmm. So I had to include some some words. I had to to compress some scenes. I had to elongate some other ones. Mm -hmm. But every every time that I was making these decisions, I made sure. Um, that uh, that they were that they were fine with that, mm -hmm. and uh, as it was the case with my parents, I had assured them, and and, uh, uh, and I was very true about this, that if uh, if something was not of their liking, if they had told me something or confided in me, a while it, uh, while we were talking to each other, but then they weren't sure about having that out in the open in the book, that I would be more than willing to. To, to remove those sections too. So I wanted, I wanted to create a, a trust uh, among ourselves and just to be sure that all of us mm -hmm. uh, were committed to, yeah. to participate in this collective uh, construction of Liliana's memory. You know, what you say about tone is, is so striking to me because the tone of the book is, I mean, it's so loving and it's also mournful. What it's not, and what I was surprised to discover that it wasn't, is it's not angry. There, there really isn't much anger to me in this book. And I don't know why I was surprised by that. I suppose I thought that there would be maybe, you know, either for Liliana or more for the Mexican state and it's the general inadequacy of its responses to femicide. And yeah. I'm wondering if, I mean, perhaps I'm not sensing it, perhaps everything else I'm naming is, is drowning it out, uh, which, which is maybe a good thing. Uh, but, but, you know, was there anger here for you? Did it get exorcised at some point? Uh, where did it go? I, or again, maybe it's there and I'm just, not, I'm just not sensing it because there are other things kind of crowding it out. Yeah, yeah, what uh, yeah, what a what a good angle. Yeah, um I think there there, there is there has been there, there still is a mm -hmm. lot of anger. I think it, it just um, goes through the whole the whole storytelling. Mm -hmm. But a decision that, that I made um early during the writing process is that I was not willing to concede to make Liliana's murder as such the protagonist of the story. So it's, it's very easy in situations of, of uh, lethal violence to concentrate all your storytelling um, on, on the side, on the, on the killing itself. And what that does, it, it seems to me, is that uh, it erases, it deletes the character, the subject. Um, I, of course, wanted to bring up um, the larger context, what I perceive as the main forces at play in, uh, in, uh, in, 
intimate partner violence uh, that leads to 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 femicide mm -hmm. but at the same time i didn't want to forget and i didn't want readers to forget that there was a life there mm -hmm. um, a complex dense life and uh, and i wanted that life to be the center of the story the protagonist of the story mm -hmm. um, my sense was and, and he is still that um, if I wanted to connect with people, if I wanted to to bring them, so to speak, to my side, I think it would have been that could be achieved much easily if people could feel um, the loss mm -hmm. as deeply as uh, as I was feeling it, or as my family did feel it feel it throughout these years. Mm -hmm. So my sense is that um, when uh, murder women uh, become numbers, or become just the stereotypes, or become passive victims of violence, then it is very much easier for us uh, to forget them and uh, to do away with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is my deep belief now that if we make everything uh everything that we are capable of to to remind others and and remind ourselves that this is lives that we are dealing with and uh, and that when we lose one of these lives we all lose mm -hmm. this is not just a, a loss for for me as a sister or, or for my family and this is a loss for for our communities for our communities in the very large sense of the word so I guess um, much of the of the emotional energy of of, uh, of the book went to that aim, but I have to say it was totally fueled by by both rage, by sorrow. Uh, I mentioned some other uh, affects that are not as as um, that are very complicated to go through guilt and shame too. Mm -hmm. So I I was trying to to convey. Uh, as complex a picture as I could, but always um, uh, trying to highlight mm -hmm. that there, there are lives here at play, that we're all losing when we lose them. You're very, I mean, I think all of your fiction and your essays are extremely good at doing just that, at giving us individuals, characters, and showing how they can be kind of shot through with these social and political forces, but that never reducing them never reducing them to just those. I have one more question and then I'll turn to the Q&A. So if people want to start um, queuing up their questions, that would be very helpful for, for me. Um, it's, it's about the title. So the epigraph, the wonderful, wonderful epigraph to the book comes from Camus. Uh, and it is, in the midst of winter, I found there was within me an invincible summer. And that repeats a little bit later on in the book itself, in the testimony of one of Liliana's friends, Norma, who has found out that her boyfriend is cheating on her. And she says she burst into tears in the classroom. Lily came over and hugged me. It's not worth it, she said. She handed me a piece of paper. In the midst of winter, I found there was within me an invincible summer. This is your winter, she added, and it will pass. Don't cry for anyone. Uh, and of course, I started crying immediately when I when I read that something about the way the epigraph returns a little bit later on in the book is so powerful. But I just wanted to ask you, or I thought we could end our portion of the conversation with you reflecting a little bit about the idea of the invincible summer and whether or not you feel like well, the way that I felt was that reading this book, living in this book, was getting to inhabit that invincible summer, even while winter still rages around us. There was a lot of that, of course, yeah. in, in that title. Um, one of the things that I came to learn about Liliana while, while writing this book is that she was such an avid reader. I have been um, lending books to her, not knowing for, for sure if she was reading them or not. I knew that she was very interested in the visual arts. Uh, she, she was an architecture student. Um, and I knew that she read uh, uh, because we, we had tons of conversation about books. I didn't know how much, how many books, with what 
kind of care yeah. uh, she was she was going through them. And so um, just finding that out was was such a it was another facet of my sister that that I that I was not expecting. I mean, as I said, she was a good reader. I didn't know that she was such an avid reader. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was this other other aspect of um, of of the title uh, when uh, when we came into her apartment to to pick up her belongings. I found on her um, on her desk um, that phrase uh, written in uh, in large large letters uh, with with her own uh, style on them in uh, her favorite ink, which was purple, mm-hmm. and um, I, I took it to be a sign. In fact. Um, we we got that 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 phrase that piece of paper we we got it framed and it's now at my parents bedroom it, it was right there uh telling us something even today mm-hmm. so when it came the time to choose a title i i had no other choice it seemed to me that it was uh, it was a measure that, that liliana left close to her working space for me to see mm-hmm. and uh and i was not going to contradict her uh, about that, mm-hmm. and on the other hand, yes, you are absolutely right. Uh, people who have read uh, this book in Spanish have um, have embraced Liliana in such a way. Uh, I think they've they they made it through the the, the phrase uh, the that invincible summer that um, that is very real. Mm-hmm. That we can work together to make it real. Mm-hmm. That it is made of uh, of solidarity, mm-hmm. of affect, of uh, of this memory that we can build all together, mm-hmm. and um, and so it just uh, it, when when it came the time to to select a, a, a title for the English version, and there was no doubt in my mind that that we were trying to convey um, that very intimate message. That Liliana left to to me and, and to my family, but also the sense that that even though we're going through this terrible winter, through what Rita Segato called um, the war against women, mm-hmm. with data that is frankly horrific, not only in countries like Mexico or Honduras, where um, when um, ten women are killed uh, daily. Uh, but let me just point something out. Numbers for the United States are are, are, are pretty bad too. Yeah. Only in year 2018, three women were killed by their intimate partners uh, every day too. Mm-hmm. So um, the winter is that winter is um, is affecting all of us, and I think. Um, um, we as a we as a community have the capacity to to reclaim to call for justice to to work for this collective memory to make sure that um that we all acknowledge their presence among us you know there's a question in the there's a question in the chat and i encourage everybody to put your questions in but there's a question in the chat about the differences between feminism and feminist movements in the in the U.S. versus in versus in Mexico, and I, I would maybe just add something onto that question and say, what do, what does justice look like? What does it mean? How will we know when we have achieved it? And is it is it different in different places or? are we talking about a kind of global solidarity, a global vision of justice? Mm. Yeah. Well, um, as I've uh, I've said uh, elsewhere, I think that I would have been able to write this book without 
the tremendous work that a range of women's movements and mobilizations, including feminist movements, mm -hmm. have done over the last um, 20, 30 years, specifically in, in Latin America and more specifically in Mexico, mm -hmm. I think is thanks to, to these mobilizations, to this awareness uh, and to daily struggles that all these women have been um, coining uh, mm -hmm. a, a more accurate more compassionate language to be able to tell these stories otherwise, you know, outside of the of the realm of the state and, and closer to our bodies and to the suffering of, of women. Mm -hmm. So um, I am and I'm and, and when I say women's mobilizations, including feminisms, I, I, I try to place as much emphasis as I can on, on the plural because there are many. And the discussions, as we know, are are, um, are many too, and, and many of them are very heated. Yeah. Uh, I am just um, grateful to to be able to, after all these many years, to have had access to a language that finally allows me to do what a writer, I think, mm -hmm. uh, does, which is to question dominant narratives, to subvert uh, ways, uh, you know, conventional ways of, mm -hmm. of uh, looking and experiencing the world. So um, I think feminism, certain feminisms in, in Latin America are, are um, very conscious about uh, gender, I mean, about class and, uh, and uh, racial uh, differences too. And I think indigenous identities are, are also a matter of, um, of concern and discussion. And, and, uh, and I think in, in very important ways. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm also reminded of the fact that uh, a, a powerful feminist mobilization in Argentina, for example, through the Marea Verde, have been able to, um, to uh, protect women's reproductive rights. Yes. And, uh, and that the same has happened in certain states in Mexico. Mm -hmm. This is happening right while in the United States, as we all know, some of these very rights seems, seem to be uh, under duress and under threat. So I think uh, the, the, what you mentioned at the end, the need for global um, solidarity, mm -hmm. the, 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 the potency that we have here in our hands to create those bridges and, and to build these, these uh, very practical uh, forms of, uh, of solidarity, I think is, is crucial. Mm -hmm. And I'm not only talking about crucial for, you know, Latin American countries, it's crucial now for the United States. We need in the United States that kind of ferocity, that kind of energy, and that kind of conviction of, a, of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the kind of future that we want. Mm -hmm. You know, one other way of thinking in solidarity or about solidarity is thinking about the different the different writers nonfiction writers who make their way not only into this book but into all of your work so we have a question in the chat about who it is that you look to in writing a book like this who your influences might be i know you just mentioned christina sharp i and i will make a plug too for her forthcoming book from FSP, Ordinary Notes, which is fantastic. I highly recommend it as well. Uh, who else is in the, who else is in the background of, of Liliana? Yeah, let me, uh, by the way, I second you. I'm eagerly awaiting for uh, the new, the Christina Sharp's new book. Um, and there, there are many, many writers of, uh, of both fiction and nonfiction, to be honest with you. I, I don't think I would have been able to think, to even conceive of this work without the influence of a, of a great Mexican writer, a nonfiction writer, uh, Elena Poniatowska. Mm. She wrote uh, um, an, um, a key book in the modern history of, uh, of Mexican literature, um, La Noche de Tlatelolco, about the, the repression of the 1968 uh, student uprising. Mm -hmm. And I think the way in which she deals with the fragments, with the public and the private, uh, with um, 
popular language at different levels. I think that I read that when I was very young and made a great impression on me. And I still now, I think, uh, I consider this to be a landmark in, in modern um, uh, Mexican literature. But I was also very influenced by writers like Teresa Cha and her dicté, mm -hmm. where uh, issues of subjectivity and about colonialism and, and um, uh, these, uh, well, obviously, issues of language, mm -hmm. all of them uh, playing such an important role as, as she is um, unfolding a history that is both deeply personal, but at the same time, very political as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I always keep Teresa Chai in my mind for pretty much whatever I do. I think she's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And um, um, more recently, I would have to say uh, that I, I've, I've been in conversation with the work of, of the likes of uh, Brando Shimoda, mm -hmm. uh, uh, also working along the lines of ancestorship and uh, how we select, work with, um, um, and, and go through uh, the experience of having ancestors and, and, uh, and being the descendants mm -hmm. of, um, of, of them. Um, I, I can think of, uh, um, there is a very interesting discussion in Latin American history right now about issues related to gender violence, uh, if not necessarily about femicide per se, but writers such as El Balmade, who has been recently translated into English, I think uh, Chicas Muertas, Dead Girls, is just a, a, a stunning book. Yeah. of terse beauty and, uh, and and she Selva is is I admire her work greatly as well um, the work by Dolores Reyes uh, Come Tierra I think is also important um, uh, Gabriela Cabezón Camara from Argentina there there is I think um, a, a very a profoundly talented group of writers thinking through violence, and specifically gender violence. And in Mexico, uh, I think that there is a group of, um, of journalists that, um, that have done incredibly important work. Marcela Turati, Daniela Arrea, among them. They've been writing books about uh, disappearances. They've been writing books about their own experiences as journalists. So I think, I'm just mentioning some of them. There are, there are plenty more. But I think this, 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 um, this has created um, a conversation uh, that within which I think the existence of this book was was finally uh, a possibility. I couldn't imagine this book without um, being a participant between uh, without um, this this conversation that surrounds it. Well, I think that's a very nice place for us to stop our discussion, Christina and. Thank you to everybody who, you. who offered a question. They were wonderful. Uh, thank you, uh, Christina, Books in Books, Harvard Politics in Prose, and Brezos for hosting. This was great. Uh, Christina, do you, I'm sure you're going to direct people to places to buy the book. Yes, just any support any of the independent bookstores that are joining forces to present this program. Um, as you said, Books and Books, Harvard, Politics and Prose, Brazos, uh, in your hometown of Houston, Texas, of course. Uh, we want to shout out to them. And thank you so much for a really thoughtful, insightful, wonderful conversation, truly. Um, and thanks to everyone watching for joining us. And we'll see you again, hopefully. May I just say... Thank you so much, Christina. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to say um, uh, thank you. I, I couldn't have thought of, of a better way to to welcome Liliana into the English-speaking world. Thank you for hosting this event, and thank you, Merve, for questions and, and readings and for your work in general. So oh, thank you thank so much. You. Thank you, everybody. Have a great Sunday. Bye, everyone. <laughs>